marketing, and personal branding has resulted in numerous speaking engagements to universities, professional organizations, and national conferences, including the Young African Leaders Initiative, led by the U.S. Department of State. She also serves on the board of Youth Spark and Spurl Center for the Arts. And Devika is a graduate of Penn State University. All right, Devika. Oh, you may be muted. I am muted. You'd think I would learn this by now, right? Two years later. <laughs> um, so can everyone hear me? Okay, yes. great. Uh, well, thank you for that intro. Um, I didn't even know that about myself. That's pretty cool. So thanks. <laughs> but um, um, yes, I am from, I did go to Penn State. So hopefully the Pennsylvania Council is in the house. Um, so um, go Nittany Lions, I guess, but I'm really excited to be here. Um, thank you, Cheryl and Robin, to invite me to do this session. And I really, really hope that all of you on this session um, are able to take away something valuable to advance the work and also message the importance of the work you're doing in your local communities and your state. Um, as I said, that we will be doing um, the Q and A's um, in the second session. So, please, but don't refrain from them. Don't like, if you have anything, drop them in the chat and let us know what's, um, what we should address in the second session. And hopefully I'll cover um, everything you want to hear. At the same time, um, I will also be excited. I'm also excited to share some of my, my favorite formula to make communications as easy as possible, but I'm not gonna make sure it's that easy. And hopefully we'll be able to, hopefully we'll be able to give you all the support that you're looking for and um, give you the exercises. So just uh, thank you, Jason, for introducing me and just a little bit about the firm. Um, I joined the firm and a little bit about me, um, which involves moving this technology, I swear everyone. Uh, a little bit about me. Um, I've been, I've, I was born and raised in Mumbai, India, and then we moved to Atlanta um, in 1993 and have been here since, except for that little getaway to Penn State that um, I was allowed to go up north and I realized it was really, really cold. So came back south. And um, I've been with the firm for almost 10 years. And actually my very first account that I was hired to run was the Georgia Council on Developmental Disability. So hi, Maria, hi, Tiana. Um, so I've been working with the, uh, with the firm for almost 10 years. Uh, we've been working with councils in a collective fashion for almost 15 years. We have about, um, we have three wonderful councils under our belt right now. And we are just so excited to do the work we do um, in a, in addition to other disability organizations and um, initiatives. So we've also supported our council's initiatives in uh, outreach. Um, the banana splits is just because that's my favorite dessert. And it's always fun to know something different outside of a professional personality. Um, so in case you ever want me to do anything, a banana split is usually a good bribe. It's just always good to know. <laughs> So that's just a little bit about me. I'm really excited to talk to you about you and your councils today. Um, so our goals, very simple goals, but maybe not, right? We're here, really here to talk about simple messaging in a communication strategy. Those sound, that sounds like a very big word, but I promise we're gonna make it simple and doable. And then we're gonna talk about how you build on it. Using strength-based language, um, how by a show of hands, how many people have heard of people first? That's awesome, I would hope so. Uh, we're gonna talk about effective messaging. How do you get that message out there? How do you, um, what, what do you message? And then also about increasing impact and reach. Um, that's always gonna be a measurement that maybe um, you're asking for your grantees. And I know that are sometimes due in your PPRs. So we're really gonna go from the PPR and work backwards. And then also some tips and timing of how do you take, um, these goals and make sure that you are hitting your hitting your marks, hitting your me measurements, and especially if you're a team of one, I know that can be really tough, but we'll we'll definitely give you some tips and timing there. So breaking it down before we get into actual talking about like how to tell your message, let's talk a little bit about communications. Um, 
when we talk about integrated marketing communications, again, that's a very heavy word, um, pretty heavy statement. What that really means is having an integrated, um, integrated comprehensive way of getting your message out. So that means how your email marketing, you use constant contact or MailChimp or any even your personal uh, work emails, uh, your website, to your social media pages, to press. Uh, so if you're getting some media, um, even events such as webinars, a lot of councils were utilizing webinars and what we're doing today to start using, uh, to start getting their work out. So how does all of the, how do all of those things work together to have the most impact and reach? So that's really what we mean when we talk about an integrated marketing communications effort. Does it mean you have to have all of these things? Not necessarily, but it's really important to know that all of these things work together to amplify your message. And why is that important? Um, because your audience does not all get the message the same way. So if you are some, if you are an email, if you're an email fan like I am, um, I know everybody's like more emails. We don't want more emails, but they're still pretty cool um, if done right. Um, or if you're getting your message from social, or if you're getting your message from websites, everybody gets their information differently. So we just have to make sure that where people are, we're meeting them there. So that is a little bit about communications in general. But before we can do any communications, before we can send that message out, guess what? We have to know the message. So before we kind of start getting into our channels, let's start working on building our message. And for councils, as you're doing the impact, as you're working about messaging the importance of your work, the message is going to be the foundation of that work. So let's get right into it. Being a DD council, here are the basics. <clears throat> who are we? Who are we? Who, are, who is the council? What is the council, right? We have so many different definitions of the councils. We have different states, different territories. Each of you have an, your own personality. So who are you as a council? What makes up the council? Um, what do we do? What do we do as a council? Cheryl, can I um, do some Socratic methods here? Maybe call on a few people? Absolutely. All right, good, because I really like to hear from people. <laughs> so, okay, sorry guys, we're gonna put some people on the spot um, on this one. So I will pick on my favorites, Maria and Tiana, since I know them. <laughs> um, so just answer me a question. Who, who are we? Who is the council? Sorry, Maria. <laughs> It's okay. Like literally Tiana and I had this conversation today um, and who we are, well, who the council is um, in Georgia are um, a selected group of stakeholders, family members, people living with and experiencing intellectual and developmental disabilities um, across the state that come together to guide our work in um, education, uh, transportation, employment, uh, and make sure that all of those facets of life that everyone encounters are um, at a place in the state where people are able to lead those lives to the best of their ability or wherever, however they choose to live their lives. Um, I don't know if that was a good answer or not. There's no right or wrong answer. This is more about knowing the basics, the 101s. Um, so, and uh, I realize that I cannot see if any hands are raised in the chat. So if there's anyone who is willing to take a, take a chance on these questions of Cheryl or Robin, would you be able to let me know? Um, so the other part, so that's a good answer, Maria. You're like, who are we? Who do we, who makes us up? What do we do? Where do we do it? So you kind of addressed a lot of that. So what do you do as a council? Tiana? You want me to answer that? Sure, yeah. I thought you were raising your hand. I'm just calling okay. you out, aren't I? <laughs> At the council, so we basically, you know, help individuals and families who um, are impacted with um, intellectual developmental disabilities and um, just helping in those areas as far as resources 
and you know making sure that they're uh, inclusive opportunities and access that's the most important that's great that's great so the, you've all sort of you both have sort of answered um, a little bit of all the questions but basically um, what we're really coming down to is knowing the basics knowing the ground floor right a good message is about knowing your foundation so when we're talking about being a dd council we're really just talking about who are we as a council what do we do as a council who does our work impact where do we have impact chances are 100 percent of you statewide and how do we do it right so if you know those basics of the like your basics of being a dd council you have started the ground floor of a good message because if you cannot answer those questions we don't have a message yet we need an identity right so this is why the basics of building a good message are really important of who we are what we do who does it impact where does do we have our impact and how do we do our, how do we do it how do we have our impact so those are the basics so thanks maria and tiana for being my little guinea pigs i appreciate it you have a fundamental mandate right all councils we can agree we have a fundamental mandate that you are in charge of systems change advocacy and your job as a council is to educate and inform those are the three very high level things that a council does through its work. So when we think about our work and when we think about our message, remember your fundamental mandate of what is passed down to you from the DD Act. And that is, this is going to be the charge that takes into your message. So going back to our, who we are, what we do, how do we do it? Here's your fundamental mandate. This is, this is again, your foundation. And all of you have a key driver. I know all of you have gone through an intense five-year strategic plan, planning sessions, listening sessions, surveys in the past year. I know we're also kicked off our new five-year plan. I know you're all in our year one. This strategic plan is your driver for all your goals and projects. So the goals are determined by your public listening sessions, any of your surveys that you have done, and then your goals are driving your initiatives or grants or projects. I know every council has different terminology for this, but essentially they're the same. So if you have a key driver that is driving all of your projects and goals and your projects with a fundamental mandate of systems change, advocacy, and education and information, and then you have your basics guess what? You've got to put together a really good foundation of a message because now you know who you are, what you do, how you do it, where you do it, and who you serve. Does that help? Does that make sense to everyone? Any, remember, if you have any questions, drop them in chat, but remember that these are the three three things that you can think about when you're developing that message for the council as you start developing that communications outreach. So before we can talk about it, we got to know what we're talking about. So, <clears throat> so what we're going to talk really specifically about today is communicating that message, right? Communicating that mandate, communicating those key drivers, our basics. And we're going to really talk about that sweet spot, which I've highlighted is your projects in your impact. And I know you must be saying like, we don't need to know about the councils, we are the councils, but it's sometimes always good to know where we're starting so we can know where we wanna go. So we're gonna really focus on the project and impact side of this today, that how your key driver of a five-year plan can determine what you're gonna do for the next five years with people with DD in your state, in your communities. And then we're gonna talk about messaging that impact. So if, if you guys don't mind in chat or raise your hand, what happens with a five-year plan? Once your five-year plan is adopted, what is, what is going on with you guys? How would your new five-year plan? Valerie Breen from Florida. Hi, Valerie. Hi. Hi. Sorry, guys, I was doing something. What was the question? <laughs> 
My question is now that you have a new five-year plan in place, yeah. what yeah. are what happens with the five-year plan? What do we do with that five-year plan? Oh my gosh. Well, <laughs> what we did in Florida is we took that five-year plan and made it into a public facing document, which was easy to look at, um, that anybody on our council could share with other people. It went up on our website. Um, what else do you want to know? <laughs> so from those goals, do you have goals in your five-year plan to talk about what you're like what you're going to be working on for the next five years? Are you all releasing RFAs and NOFAs? Uh, every council also has different verbiage there um, for projects and grants that you will be funding throughout the five years to move forward your goals. Um, well, what we did basically in Florida is we based everything around our original statement that we had created a while back in our website when we designed the website. So we said that we affect policy and services for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities, their families and their supports through education, advocacy and partnerships. And that was encompassing, I think, everything that you talked about before. When we look at the five-year plan, if that's our major mission and focus, then everything we highlighted in our five-year plan public-facing document really focuses on um, what we highlighted were, were some of the things that came out of our groups, our data, the things we did in creating the five-year plan. Um, I would love to show you the document on the screen, but basically, it's taking a five-year plan that has a lot of pieces in it, a lot of requirements, and bringing it down to who is the general public and the people we're serving that have to understand it. And it becomes the guide rail for them. All the parts and pieces that we have to do behind the scenes, we have to keep our constituency focused on the big picture. So how we took that from uh, if your question is a marketing piece, is trying to translate the language of what we found in our comprehensive review and analysis around the central pieces of the five goals that our council chose because of the feedback from everybody that we got. Does that make sense? Did that answer your question? That makes a lot of sense. So there are a couple of things I heard in that. One, you created a simplified document to make sure it's public facing. So yeah. whether it's your council members, whether it's a general community, um, whether it's the media, whomever, uh, lawmakers who can quickly understand what is a driver of your council. That's what I understood. Yes. Secondly, I understood that you have five goals and yes. each of those goals, I'm sure, have some results attached to it, some measurements and metrics that you will have to report back, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. And your work eventually um, is going to want to meet those goals, correct? Correct. Correct. So bringing it right back to this slide, we're really talking really about that work, those measurements, those goals, and the, the way you're going to make those impacts. And what happens in this space is, how are we gonna talk about that impact? You all are doing great work. You all are on the grassroots level. You're, um, whether you're funding IPSI schools, whether you're doing projects around um, employment or you're doing projects around transportation, you're doing such great work. It can be research oriented, it can be community oriented, but how do we talk about that impact to show that the council is going back to that fundamental mandate of systems change, advocacy, and education and information. So- Devika, I think that uh, Nancy Cronin had something that she wanted to share. Okay, thank you. Sorry, I can't see the chat. I don't need to. I was just going to, to I was gonna answer your question in which I was gonna say that what are we doing after we got the, we're implementing our five-year plan through demonstration projects, through, through, through pilots, as well as through um, in-person coalition building and education to impact real people to see if what matters actually is, improves. I love it. And so exactly what you said, right? Sharing if the impact is actually moving your needle. 
And you're doing that through your demonstration projects, your pilot projects, and that's exactly um, and that's exactly what we're talking about today is you're taking your key driver of your five-year state plan and now pushing it into um, outreach and doable projects. And now we're gonna go backwards and say, what was the impact? Did we move our needle? Did we make that? Did we reach our goals? And if we got almost there, what else do we need to do, right? So excellent, exactly. So. This is the fun part about what, um, what we love to do here at the firm is finding the story. We're talking really right now brass tacks, right? We're talking about the basics of the council. We're talking about the five-year plan. We're talking about those goals. But inside all of that is a great stories. You have data. And we're gonna talk about that a little bit later in the presentation. But um, here's my hack. I'm gonna teach you a simple way to find stories again um, I understand when you're sometimes a comms team of one or two, or even if you have 10, um, finding the story can be very hard. Um, so here, we're going to talk about that today and talking about those impact pieces and how do we help um, councils move forward their impact, but also their outreach. So what you'd like to know is how do you find your stories? I'm going to tell you they're right in front of you. Um, where do you share your stories? We'll talk about that as well. How do you put them together? That's my formula and you are all privy to it and I'm so excited. And how do you know it's gonna work? Uh, we're gonna look at the best piece ever, data. And we're gonna talk, all, we're gonna talk about that um, right now. And again, in session two, we'll put these exercises to work and you can ask any questions you want. And... Apparently, I cannot move my slide forward right now. Hmm. Well, that was sad. All right. Sorry, guys. I think I had a little bit of a technical issue. Ah, here we go. The stories. Yeah, some, it's finicky, I guess. Uh, the stories that are right in front of you. We just talked about it, Nancy. And I'm so sorry. I didn't catch the first name of the uh, lady from Florida. Valerie. Valerie. Okay. Valerie. Um, so yes. Nancy and Valerie address a little bit about the stories that are right in front of them. The five-year state plan. We started off with that conversation. So remember, that's your baseline. That's the key driver for all of your work. Your council members. These are the people who are not only governor appointed, but they're ambassadors to your community. They are going back home to talk about their work on the council. These are your stories. Your partners, um, your DD network, um, any organizations you're partnering with and that are amplifying your message. These are stories, your initiatives, your projects, your grants, um, all of the people you're funding, the demonstration projects you were talking about, Nancy, the pilot projects you're talking about, um, your initiatives essentially are how they are impacting the community you serve. You are funding these projects because you want to move a needle when it comes to people with DD to live independently in their community, to go to school, to go to work. So these are the stories that are literally sitting in front of you. You don't have to go very, very far to find them. So what we're gonna do is talk about pulling these stories in and making sure that we can push them back out so we can start messaging the impact of the council. <clears throat> I think I see something in chat. I'm really afraid to click my mouse. <clears throat> no, there's nothing. Okay. So here's a quick example of finding the stories that are right in front of you. So at, uh, one of the councils we get to work with is a North Carolina Council on Developmental Disabilities. In 2020, as we all know, the pandemic um, hit the world. And in part of the NCCDD's work, they released a mini grant for programs and organizations for one-time relief for people who are doing programs for people with DD across the state. So they funded about 31 small groups and organizations, of course, we don't, we don't know how that's selected, that's internal. But once those were, once those were funded, the stories were right in front of us. We were able to go find those stories. We found out who they, um, who they funded, what happened with those funds, um, who was impacted, how were they impacted. So as you can see, we 
uh, we went in and we got the information from the council and they shared and all these individuals you see on the mini grant side, um, the right hand side of the slide, they were just some of the organizations that received the funding. Not everyone wrote back to us or not everyone could tell us what was going on. So we told our stories briefly. We just asked, you received this funding. What were you able to do for people with DD in a time when they were feeling isolated, everyone was isolated, and in a time where everyone was a little scared about what was going on? The other way we were able to tell that story is we created a map. We created a map of outreach to say where what, where were these organizations that received the mini grants and what where were the people that were impacted so quickly with a visual you're able to see some where the recipients were so you see that they were statewide they were far reaching and then we were able to tell their stories very quickly simply of how they were able to support people with dd in their community so we had art projects um we had outdoor activities we also had of Zoom friends meetings, things like that. So that way we were telling some really good stories, but they were also impacting the work of a simple grant that the council had put out that, that summer. So that is a quick example of a story that is right in front of you. Your grants, your projects are stories that are right in front of you. So <clears throat> going forward, how did we get those stories? Here's, here's the hack. The five W's and the how is the best way to get your stories. Um, I was a journalism major in college. I was actually a former reporter before I joined O'Neill. So this, um, this has traveled with me through and through. It is a part of the work we do every day in this firm. And this drives everything we do in good communication. These are the, this is a formula for good communication. Um, you will not go wrong. So if you go back to the basics, when we were talking about the basics of the council, remember what I was asking you and remember what you were answering. Who is the council? What do we do? How do we do it? Where do we do it? And why do we do it? And that's your formula for a really good story. The who, the what, the where, the when, the why, your five W's. And I threw in the how, because I always want to know the how. So the formula is five W's in the how. If you can answer these, these six questions, you will have an excellent story to tell about the grants you're funding, about your council members, about your partners, your network, your five-year plan, anything. Those are the questions you need to answer whenever you're working on impact of the council. Taking all of those pieces and putting it together, you get the best storyteller, and that's data. That's going to be data. And I know data can sometimes seem very overwhelming because it sounds like nothing but numbers and it sounds like miles and miles of spreadsheets, but it's really not. It can be something as simple as how many people attended an event or how many people submitted an application to be a part of a new self-advocacy program you are releasing through a grant. That can be some that is simple data so so we can go we can go in that direction and say if you're setting up a program for. Um, employment and you want to get individuals involved self advocates let's see how many people got involved and then when and how many people signed up guess what those stories are right in front of you, so if you had five people sign up or 10 people sign up let's talk to them let's find out why they signed up. Let's find out what they got out of that uh, program. But how you can get those data points is, and we brought this up earlier, was that big PPR report that I know all of you um, totally love and are very familiar with um, that starts from the top. So bring it back, bring it to the bottom. Driven by that reporting, these data points should just be in the very beginning. So get them done in the top front end. So when you're getting to those reports, you have a solid report to start with. So put them in put them in part of your grant funding, put them in parts of how you're doing your outreach so you can find out exactly where your impact is. And that's gonna be important because when you request your stories, you can also tell your project grantees or anywhere else you're talking about with the council 
as a couple of narratives about this council initiative and impact. Um, I know from my experience, sometimes I we have to go up and present to the council and tell them about the work we're doing and tell them about the impact communications is having and what we were able to support the council with or the staff with. Um, and we always come back with stories and data. We are always able to make good decisions because of data and because of what we are able to collect, but we're always collecting at the front. So for example, I will use um, NCCD again as an example. They had a series of webinars recently. And what we were able to help them with is collect the data up front. So when you people were registering for those webinars, we were able to ask certain things like, um, are you a person with IDD? Are you a family member? Are you an employer? Uh, depending on the situation of that webinar, what part of North Carolina are you from? So we took zip codes to understand geographic data. So that was also really important for us to see our outreach. And then we also asked some other simple things that the council needed to know. Are you in an urban or rural area? Um, or, you know, do you, I forget the other question, but we have uh, race, gender, anything that they really need to know, we were able to ask on that front end as data collection. What that allowed us to do was also pivot really fast. So when we were asking questions like, where, um, where do you live? What's your zip code? We were able to see, we're getting a lot of people from say Raleigh. We really want people from Asheville and Charlotte or the Outer Banks. Then we were able to change our way of communicating to make sure we got more individuals across the state. Now, I know that sounds like a really big uh, leaning, but just to show you how we can use data to make different kinds of decisions and move our stories. But really going back to the brass tacks of it, you can collect these stories about the impact, about how people uh, were able to get services or supports or even learn about the council from your project initiatives and they should be able to give you a couple of narratives or stories about the council impact. And these will really help not only from a reporting standpoint, but to also talk about your impact going forward. Here's a simple example we did for the Ohio DD Council, which is another great council we work with about using the data we have to create a community. Um, Council applications. While this map is very current, um, while this map is very, very current, uh, when we started it, it wasn't as colorful. So when they first asked us to do, when they first asked us to do the Cal for Council members application, we worked backwards. We went and saw where the council, current council members are. So what we were able to find out was there were not that many Orange counties at that time, I will tell you. But at that time, we were able to say we had a lot of people from Cincinnati or we had a lot of people from Columbus. So what we did was really focus in on the counties that were not filled in. This is a current map. It wasn't looking like this a couple of years ago. But what we were able to do is really start thinking about if we're going to do council member applications, let's go where they're not. That helped us increase our impact not only by getting the word out about the council in those certain areas, as you can see, we still have some work to do, but that was giving us a charge of saying, well, this is where we need to go. How did we do that? Um, we found some local media, we found a local newspaper, or we tapped some of our council members, to be honest, to go ask them to be the ambassadors of their community, encourage people to get involved. Each state has a different way of how it's aligned with HHS and how you deliver services. So work within your state to see how that is devised up. But for example, with Ohio, there are county boards on DD. We reached out to all the county boards on DD to make sure that they knew that the council was looking for applications, but we really targeted the council counties, the counties where council was not present. And we were really excited when we were told that not only did we get more applications than they've ever received in that first campaign, but we also wound up getting council members from counties that the council had never had representation of. So that's 
the point of using data to go backwards and creating a story and creating a community. So we have been, this is again, an updated map. We've been able to do another call for council members campaign and start spreading, spreading the good word about the Ohio DD Council across the state. But that is how you use data and simple data. You have your council members, you know where they're from, start there and you can start creating community and your impact from that. So strength-based language. I know a lot of you talk, we, we raised our hands a little bit earlier talking about people first, and we're gonna talk about that as well. But there's something really important you must know when we're talking about messaging. The way you tell a story is how someone perceives it. And that is, may not, that is something that is super important when we're talking about anything. Now I'll give you a quick example. If I went to New York City for a weekend and you asked me tomorrow, like, well, how was your trip? And I told you, oh my gosh, it was, there are people everywhere. They are so loud and it's so dirty. And there is just so much traffic. There's a pretty high chance if someone asked you, well, I'm going to New York, like, well, Devika went and I don't think she really liked it. Don't you think that would be how you perceived my comments about a city? But if tomorrow you ask me, oh, how was your trip to New York? I say, oh my gosh, the city is so vibrant. There are people everywhere. There's so much activity and it's so colorful and bright. There's a very high chance you now perceive that I loved New York and I loved being there. And if someone asks you about a recommendation, like, well, Devika just came back from New York and she loved it. So do you see how two, one simple visit can have two different perceptions? So simply put, the way you tell a story is how someone perceives it. So we're going back to the basics again. And it's basically what we talk is positioning. So how I position New York is how you understood about my, my trip. So this is how we're talking about positioning, not only the DD community, but people with IDD, the family members, the caregivers, everyone who is involved, our council members and any partner organization across the state. So of course we talk about people first language. It does exactly what it says. It puts people before the disability. If you're, if you're paying attention, a lot more media, a lot more people are starting to use people first language in their writings, in their uh, conversations, and that's a good sign. Um, normalize the actions. Uh, let's refrain from any kind of superheroes or achievements or inspiration status. Tell the story as if you were telling anybody else's story that it's not different. Because again, the way you tell it is the way it's perceived. So tell it as if going to work for someone who has a disability is no different than someone who does not have a disability. And that's how you start normalizing communications. That's how you start strengthening this community by positioning them in a place of power, positioning in the place of normalcy, as well as ability. My favorite question in the world is always why. I always say asking that question is my best and worst quality um, and I will die on that hill. Because if the why is answered, you can really tell a story well. So going back to the council, why is this grant important? Why was it issued? Why is this goal a part of the five-year plan? So when you constantly answer the why, what you're doing is you're convincing, you are positioning, you are quote unquote selling the story really well and your impact really well. Like, well, why did we do uh, demonstration projects around employment or self-advocacy? Or why are we uh, funding, why are we funding uh, transportation projects? Why? Because transportation is a need for people with disabilities because they need to get to work, they need to get to, uh, school, like just like everyone else. So, so if you start telling people the why, not only does your impact get a frame, but then what happens is you can tell that story to anyone. You can tell that story to lawmakers, your advocacy mandate, don't forget that. You can educate and inform by telling people the why. And then you can continue, and then you can continue to expand your reach outside of just our council, outside of just our partners, but really making sure that we're meeting our fundamental mandate of advocacy, education, information, and also systems change. 
And good communication comes with good intention. Um, and intention is a really fancy word for goals, but I really just like it better than the word goals. Uh, mm -hmm. But when you have a good intention and you have a set intention behind your communication strategy, you're definitely gonna meet it. And that intention comes back to my favorite question is why? Why are we doing this? And if you, and if you can answer the why are you doing this, um, you will be miles ahead of your communication strategy. A couple of quick things about communication. We describe it in a couple of ways. We call it push and pull marketing. So we push messages out to pull people in, right? So that's essentially what you hear in basic communication strategies sometimes. Well, how are we pushing this message out? Because we want to pull people back in. Websites, I realize I just have a little spelling error. Pretend that was not there. Uh, we have social media and we have email. These are not the only ones, but these are some, these are the most popular ones people ask us about all the time. Um, a website is your poll. People come into your website. You always pull people into the website. Social media is your push. You push your message. You push it out through graphics, through video, through posts. And again, to pull people back in. And email, again, another push to pull people back in. Um, as you, if you may not believe me, but email is the number one way still till today to communicate with your audience. Don't let the social media world trick you. It is not. Email marketing will always, it is still number one. It is the easiest way to reach your audience. And I'll explain in a minute why. The other way to look at these three channels, uh, three spaces is a channel. Um, I like calling them channels because it's a really easier way to picture what they do. They channel, they're conduits for your message, right? Um, so think about it like, I always say like, think about it like your television, but before you had Netflix, every channel, you had channels everywhere. And what was important about these channels? What was on these channels? Not everybody at once. That's Nobody? Content. Your message was on your channels, whether it was a show, whether it was news, whether it was a game show or um, a talk show. It's all content. It was all these channels had content. So looking at your website or social media or email, um, there are channels, there are ways you're getting your message out. So you have to have a good message. Going back to our storytelling method of the five W's and the how. So how are you building those? Through that formula, where is your story, your grants, your council members, your NOFAs, your RFPs, your five-year plan? Look at how much content you already have. And now just push it out to pull people back in. So why is this all important? It's because you must amplify the work you're doing and the future opportunities that the council provides. Um, gone are the days of media. I say that being facetious, but I'll explain why this is actually way more empowering than you think it might not be. Um, you're building your platform. This is how you're building leadership. Whether you're a council um, staff or members of a small one or you have a big one, you have your own platform. You're talking about your own message. You're controlling that narrative and utilizing your own messages and stories. You're able to tell it the way you want to tell them. It is um, solving your, I wish more people knew about our council. Um, how many people have that issue? Like, I wish more people knew about the council. Can't see raised hands, but I assume a few are. <laughs> um, yes, um, we have um, Anna Krieger from Massachusetts. Okay. We have a oh, lot of raised hands. Voting. I wasn't trying to. Try oh, you were. Oh, oh, you, <laughs> I oh, saying, oh, I got you. I wish more people knew about the council. <laughs> Sorry. You wish. Gotcha. Yeah. So a lot. So I feel like a lot of people might be having that issue. Like, I wish more people knew about us. And how many of you all wish that a lot of them knew outside of your state capital or your bigger cities? Yeah, I think their hands are, I'm just going to assume my hands are raised, but I'm sure they are. Um, so this is a really interesting problem, right? This is a really, you're doing statewide work and, every, and most of the councils we've worked with, 
we, we hear the same thing. Every council we walked in with was, well, we don't seem to get outside of our capital. We don't seem to get outside of the main, main city. And that makes sense. That's the biggest city. It has a state house in it. And so that makes sense. But now we're talking about getting back to who we're serving, going back to the basics. Where are we supposed to be? We're supposed to be statewide, working for people across the state. So when you have that basic foundation of a message, when you think about your basic channels, then you can really start to think about creating your own platform and talking about your own message. And you're not worried about if you're getting press or PR or media, those things will come, but at least you have to start with setting the foundation of a good message. And like we talked about earlier, the five W's and the how, get it from the beginning, from your projects, your five-year plan, your council members, you're gonna have a treasure trove of stories that you can talk about you, your organization, your projects, your collaborations, conferences, anything and everything. I lost my cursor again. All right. Sharing the impact. Um, this is what we're here to talk about. We gotta build a good message. We have to use data. We have to make sure the people we work with, whether it's a partner, staff, a council member, a grantee or initiative, they're giving us the stories that um, you should have from the very beginning. And now we're talking about amplifying them. Sharing your impact. Some simple things you all can think about, right? Require your council logo to be included in grantee work and outreach. It's very simple. If you are funding a project and if you are giving funds towards um, any kind of project towards your five-year plan goals, make sure your logo is a part of that project. Um, countless number of times I've seen uh, projects go without uh, the council logo on it, whether there's, and it's funded by the council, that's an easy, really, really easy way to make sure your impact is amplified in a passive way, but your logo, your recognition is getting amplified throughout circulation. So make sure your grantee work, your initiatives, anything that is part of the council, your logo is with it. If you're doing events or um, people, are, your grantees are doing something, they're doing email marketing or reaching out, request that data, such as how many people attended, how many people were reached, how big was that mailing list that was sent? Um, I know that's more communications oriented, but that sometimes can tell you a lot about who may have seen your work. Um, who was in the audience? Um, again, if you ask for that information from the beginning, so if you tell your grantee, we have to collect this information for our big federal reports every year, and you tell them from the front end, you're, you will have this information. You will have that information ready to go because they're supposed to collect it too, because they're getting funding from you, where and you are supposed to report back to your funders. So it's just about creating a funnel of streamlined information. Ensure that the council event or grantee events or their projects are including those questions as who was served, identifications, locations, uh, race, ethnicity, gender, urban, rural, all of those things. If you start thinking about that, like I said, from the beginning, then you're just going to have your stories ready to go. And you're also gonna be able to get data that you're gonna start thinking about well, looks like we're always reaching this part of our state. Maybe we need to make sure we're reaching this part of our state. Um, do we need to make sure grantees are coming from this part of our state? Whatever that looks like for your individual um, five-year plan, your state, your outreach, it really helps you think about it from the ground floor. And then require those success stories from each grantee quarterly, monthly, however you feel the cadence is right. And then ask them for the five W's and the how. It should be at the bottom of every funding and you'll get a great report. You'll also get great content. And then if they can, and if their project allows for it, ask for photos and videos. Um, I did put a tip in there that today's smartphones are very smart. So you are, uh, they have excellent cameras. They have excellent um, ways to take video. You don't need a high end production. But make sure you ask for this as you're thinking about your outreach. If a council member is speaking at an event, um, some of our council members and my various councils are speakers. They are 
they're doing some great things. Find out what your council members are doing. Um, one of our recent um, one of our recent council members was elected to a local board. We got that information. We pushed that out there because that's great news that they are taking positions of leadership outside of just the council. So think about it that way. Who is right in front of you? Your council members are right in front of you. What is going on with them that they are willing to share? And when you humanize that space, when you humanize the council, it makes the message a lot easier because then they see the people you're working with and for. Uh, plan ahead. Some things, uh, timing is everything, as you all know, although right now it seems like time is on this very fast bullet train and I, um, I'm sure all of us can agree. Um, but think about some of our key awareness months and I know, I know a lot of you know all of these already. We have DD awareness, we have ADA coming up. Um, August is ABLE month, uh, of course, ending in October. If you kind of, these are just a few of them. I know there's tons more. Um, but if you think about all these awareness months, think about where your stories might fit in really well. Um, something as simple as, you know, an advocacy story would go really well in July because of the American Disabilities Act, because that was a big form of advocacy. Um, is someone on your council or a grantee or a project or initiative about employment? Let's plug them in October. Um, is your state doing anything around financial readiness or financial security? Let's talk about it during August. These simple things can just help you think about communications a lot easier and a lot earlier. And when you use the formula of five W's and a how, you'll have that story ready to go. And it doesn't have to be a big newspaper cover story. It doesn't have to be a magazine splash page. It can be a very simple, this is what the council is doing and this is how it's serving the people with uh, the disability community in our state. Now, if you're a party of one or you're a party of two, I commiserate and I totally understand. I have been a party of one communications team for um, some time in my career. And um, it's not only hard, but it's a lot. So what I give you advice is keep it simple. You don't have to do the whole thing at the same time. You don't have to worry about that very big integrated communications workshop. Um, you don't have to have that already. Just start in a simple manner of things like a quarterly email and send stories out to your council, your members, your partners. You already have a community. You have a network. You have people who are engaged with you. That's your network. Whether it's a list of 100 or 1,000 or even 2,000, that is an important list. Send, start slow and start simple, and it's okay. And then if you are on social media um, and you have a good story ready with, or you have an event, or you just wanna talk about your five-year plan, just post it when you have it ready. Simply like three, three to five social media posts a month is good enough to start and be simple. You don't have to go absolutely crazy because I know it's a lot of work and I know you have a lot of work to do. So think about it that way where what is manageable, but what is relevant. So make sure you're hitting your marks and then you're able to sort of build your communications that way. There are free tools like Canva. Um, it's an art uh, graphics tool. I believe there's a free version of it. It obviously like everything free has its limitations, but it's a really good place to start. Uh, MailChimp is free-ish. And I say that because um, it is based on contacts. So up to a, I think 2000 contacts it's free as a tool. Um, obviously, again, all free things don't have all the things, all the bells and whistles, but these are good places for you to start if you're looking for simple ways to keep your communications, uh, to light up your communications, to start kind of getting the ball rolling. And then um, Hootsuite, I believe is still free. I hope it is, but I know when we started out, it was kind of a free channel. And this is our social media managing tool. So if you have if you have a social media a page, whether it's one, if you have a Facebook page and a Twitter page, or you have just one, that's totally fine. Um, what this allows you to do is allows you to schedule ahead. And I do believe Canva maybe um, has social media now in it. I can't remember off the top of my head, but these are some simple tools that are out there 
when you're doing simple communications that can help you um, organize it a little bit better. You can schedule things in advance when you have, um, you know, that thing they call free time. And um, that way it kind of gives you some kind of cadence and it sort of start, and when you start seeing that role, it sort of keeps inspiring you to keep going. But these are simple ways if you're, if you're a small team or a team of one, you can just keep it simple and make sure you get the important information um, about the impact out. If you are friends with local media, make sure they get a story once in a while and just put them on your email list and keep sending them as you have something available. Um, consistency and frequency is the key, but we also understand that there's just a lot happening. So send it when it's relevant, send it, um, send it in time, and just and that will also allow you to plan ahead. And sometimes simple, simple ways are a good way to start. What's gonna be really important to know underneath all of this um, in terms of good communications and good impact, right? Um, one channel, good communication is not only about one channel. So, and I know I said email is my favorite and we'll talk about that in a minute, but it's, it's not just one channel because everybody gets messages such in different ways. Um, good communication is not digital only. So I know we're all digital now, case in point, but uh, what COVID has taught us that there are a lot of individuals who do not get access to digital or to, uh, broadband as much as a lot of us do. So while it doesn't mean that we solve that problem, it's just always a good uh, keep it in the back of your head is how do we make sure that people who may not be digitally savvy or have digital access get our information? It doesn't mean you have to solve it today, but it's always good to have it as something in the back of your head because that'll also help you solve the we need to make sure people across the state know about us. And then your email list. Um, I love email because these are your VIPs. These are the people who are in. These are the people who are bought into your council. They know what you're doing. They love what you're doing. And this starts with your council members. Um, this can start with your projects, your staff, former council members. Uh, this can also start with, um, if you have events, people who sign up for your events, your email list, like I said, can be as simple as 100 people, or it can be as big as 2,000 people, or even bigger than that. But these are the people who are here because they, they know what the council does, and they know they are interested in the work. So always treat them like they're the first ones, they get the exclusive party invite. Um, that means they should be the first ones to get any kind of information. So if they have a, if you have a new NOFA, new RFP, new story to tell, put in your email, send out that quarterly email, send out a monthly newsletter, whichever way is easier for you, but make sure you let the people who are vested always know what's happening. And that way they can keep in touch with the council. And that's how you create a network also and be able to talk about your impact. Um, I hope this was helpful for our kind of an overview, but if you want to stick around for session two, we're going to kind of build upon, a, upon this where your Q's and A's are going to come in. We can also do some exercises to build on what we talked about, and you can ask me anything and um, make sure you have what you need to move forward and get enhance your messaging and your impact of your great work. So that is my session for this part, and hopefully we'll stick around for another um, Stick around for the second part. Thanks, Devika. Um, we do have a couple of, um, if I could just pose a question um, mm -hmm. that came in when you were uh, talking about um, the different channels. Um, we had a, a comment in the chat box about so many of our community members who have intellectual and developmental disabilities don't use email or social media. And so the question was around how can councils maximize non-virtual communication forms? Um, and I'm, I guess I'm thinking, um, you know, when we think about non-digital um, methods, I, I think that means a, um, a newsletter kind of, <laughs> is that what, what your non-digital would, would kind of encompass? 
no and no and yes it can be both okay. um because uh when we say newsletter nowadays i think of, uh it is electronic everybody uses a constant contact or mailchimp uh, one of the things with the council, um, I know we can always do is offer it as a print version, but I think that is a very good question. Um, and that is something that like um, we were just discussing that not everything is digital. Um, not everyone is digitally uh, have access. So an, a great way to think about a channel would also be community partners, right? So where do people go to uh, whether it's um, look whether they work or they have a community center church things like that their local areas that they trust get their they trust for their information and i think that's a very important question and thank you to um who asked that is that um relying on digital only whether it's an e-newsletter or social media or a website um you're gonna miss out on a really big part of people um, a lot of people have asked me about text message marketing. I will tell you that that is, I'm, I'm neither here nor there on text message marketing. I feel like it's very private. So um, I wouldn't I wouldn't endorse it, but I feel like uh, if you wanted to explore that, I would want you to trust your instinct on your audience. And um, But the way to reach people that are not digitally savvy is really look at uh, local community organizations where they uh, spend their time. If you have, if if you're lucky to have a local media around it, like smaller newspapers, um, make partnerships with them because those are the people who can get information out there. Um, any other kind of provider agencies or uh, educators or any any kind of place where there are touch points, like doctors, medical providers, those are also a part of your channels. Those are the people who are going to carry your message. So um, that's an excellent question. So think about it from that perspective of not just sitting on digital and thinking about it from, well, I clicked a button and off it went and we have gotten our message out there. It is about thinking a little bit broader and saying, how do we bring these partners in? Um, how do we reach out to these kind of um, first touch points and who they trust? So the most important thing about communication, which I wanna make sure I emphasize, is that you have to go where the people are. They're not gonna come to you. So in order to go, like you have, to, in order to get your message across, you have to meet them there. So that is something I would uh, definitely think about is who are your state partners? Where, what is going on in those crevices of the state where people might not be savvy or might not have access? So how do we touch them and how do we get the information? Well, who do they trust? and we have to make friendships and partnerships with them. And um, that would be my, um, that would be my like advice on that. I know it's very broad based and it probably sounds very overwhelming, but it, it can be done. <laughs> it can be done, you're so positive. <laughs> um, so we've got a lot of robust questions that you're going to then, we're gonna um, go ahead and launch a couple of polls right now so that I can, um, gather some information about this content. Um, so if you guys will weigh in, I would appreciate that. And I, I have uh, another poll, um, I guess, that's going to come up too. Um, so uh, what we're going to do is remember you only had one link for both set, both parts of this session. So if you... Um, I'm sorry, I obviously can't do two things at one time, right? Um, and I'm going to launch a second poll. Okay, thank you. Um, so what we were going to do is take about a 20 minute break at 3.30 Eastern time. We will open this session back up and we will go into questions and answers. And then um, Devika's got a couple of, of really cool little exercises that we can work through and you can practice some stuff. So um, we want you to, uh, you know, you can step away, you can eat your snack with us all watching. Um, if you like, that's fine. Uh, but we're going to start again at 330 Eastern time. Thank you. Thanks, everyone for listening. I appreciate it. <laughs>
Welcome everyone. My name is Luz uh, from DCDD Council. Um, thank you all of you for joining us to the second section of the demonstrative impact and messaging for the importance of the council work. Um, we hope that you continue taking notes about these great ideas and ways to enhance the message of our activities and the impact of the DD Council work and the way we engage with the people with the mental disabilities and their family. Some of the already great strategy that, that we have already is that the five W's and the how, the why, the story, and how to integrate the message and keep the good communication with the community what they are. So, Rebecca and Cheryl, take it away. All right, thank you so much. Um, so I, I think I'll kind of turn this first part back to you all because I know there were a lot of questions. Um, so I was reading through them in chat and I'm really excited to sort of address a few of them and then but what we're going to do and then we're going to go into some tactics with you all and you can work with me um, uh, on this workshop and uh, like answer ask any questions build it along with me and then we can talk about simplifying and especially if you're a small team. So I'm going to kind of dive into the questions if that's all right Cheryl because I know we had a lot. Absolutely. Um, so one of the questions, I know there's so many, I'm going to have to scroll back up. <laughs> so, um, so some of the, the biggest question I do think we got was from Allison about what do you do with a small team? What are the top three things you do in there? Um, somewhere else I saw, and I apologize if I miss, um, if I miss someone who asked this, but like if you have a small team and how do you divvy up the work? So it really comes back down to your what is really really important and i know each council is different from in size in, in you know in allocation and all of that so every council has its own personality and i totally understand that so when you're talking about what is an easy way to just think about where is our starting point really just go back to the basics really just think about where are we now and really like what is what is happening at this current moment so when we were talking about the basics answer those five w's and the how internally answer them for yourself first before you can figure out where you're going to go right um and that's actually what we would call building elevator pitch so think about the elevator ride it's not the empire state building but it's a good three to four story building so what can we tell somebody in that small up and down but um, so really start with what do we have to get done? And your PPRs are a really good foundational start, right? So if you know there is some uh, a deliverable you have to meet from a reporting aspect, from a funding aspect, then start backwards. So go from that and start working backwards. Well, we have to report back this or we have um, allocated this amount of money, we have to show results. So when you start backwards, you can also start thinking about what you have to get from the front end to start building your messaging back out. Does that, um, I hope that makes a little bit more sense, um, especially when you're talking about a smaller communications team and what you kind of have to do the top three. The top three things that just in our work we've had to do when we're reporting back to our councils is really talking about our impact. Now, a communications uh, project is a little different, right? Because we're talking about messaging, we're talking about outreach, we're talking about marketing. So our impact is a little different than say a demonstration project or um, a self-advocacy leadership class. So those deliverables might be a little different, but when we understand what a council has to report back, we ensure our marketing efforts, our communications efforts, our collections at the top end are really geared to that. So um, I'll give you a good example. One, uh, one of our councils, we are supposed to make sure that we send, um, we talk about their initiatives, right? That's part of our communications work. So as part of our communications plan is to make sure that at least every quarter, we talk about one of the initiatives, whether they have something new coming up or just say who, what, where, when, why, and how. And those are sometimes the very basics you can do is just an introduction campaign, um, just an introduction story. And when you're talking about divvying up the work, again, go back to keeping it simple. You don't have to have the whole thing. You don't have to have a full integrated communications, emails, social media, 
video, you don't, that's nice to have, of course, but if you don't have the funds or budget, or you don't have the team or all of the above, then start simple, a quarterly email and um, a quarterly email that basically tells people kind of like a quarterly progress report that talks to your partners, your council members, your uh, DD network, um, grants, projects, former council members, lawmakers, media. So collect that little bit of community and start making sure that whether it's coming from the executive director, so it's coming from leadership in its in of itself, and then divide that work up. So who's in charge of getting those stories, if it's a grants manager or is, um, someone in charge of all these projects. So I would really start to think about back to the basics. What is it that you know about your council? What it, where's your council now? And what can we do to make sure that you're getting the at least the bare communications out there and don't worry about the big stuff yet. Um, if you're not, if you're not there budget wise, team wise, that's okay. But keep it simple. Uh, utilizing tools like Canva. I saw a few comments in the chat about Canva and um, Hootsuite and things like that. Um, those are helpful. And a little bit of conversations about accessibility. Um, Canva is a lot of fun, um, especially when you're not a designer. It's just like it, it's just like heaven on earth. You're like, I didn't know all these things were possible. Keep it simple there too. Don't have to have the flashiest graphics. You don't have to have the most amazing design skills. Um, keep it simple, high contrast fonts. So um, I believe um, open source, I wanna say that's the correct word, open source is the most accessible font and it is in Canva. Um, I do not know if it's in Microsoft Office or Macs or whatever everybody else uses, but um, open source is a, um, and I'm going to double check. I'm going to fact check myself on that, but I know it has a source in it. But it is uh, it is the most accessible font. So make sure you use high contrast. Black on white is, is the most uh, accessible format of type there is. Put your logo on a graphic and um, make sure it's accessible by simple comment. Canva isn't accessible with screen readers. So Canva is actually a builder. It's a, it's, a, it's a graphic builder. So if you're using Canva graphics and you're say you're using it in social media or you're putting it in an email, then make sure you put all text. Um, so that's where the accessibility comes in. So uh, because Canva is just really an online graphics tool, which has come, um, come about. So if you're using anything like that, just make sure you're putting alternative text or descriptive text whenever you're using it in like a constant contact email or um, any kind of graphics um, outreach work like social media. Uh, Facebook does not have any kind of um, internal alt text yet. So on your Facebook post, uh, make sure you put image descriptions, but that um, that is the best way I can advise you on um, accessibility and screen readers for Canva graphics. Uh, because you cannot embed all text inside of them, at least yet. Um, single link. Okay. Um, so just kind of going back to uh, what looks like for accessibility pieces, just making sure anything you're using is high accessible, so high contrast when it comes to websites. I will refrain from that. They're not my strong suit. I have a great team that does websites, uh, but that's a whole different gamut when it comes to accessibility. So do um, think about uh, when you're talking about uh, website accessibility is a little different than graphics and make sure you're using large print, uh, easy to read fonts. And like I said, um, Arial open source are kind of like the simple ones that are clean and everyone has them. So just kind of going into, I know there's a lot of questions and comments, so um, we'll kind of go into it. Um, um, so again, just to repeat a little bit what we said last um, in the last session, we're really gonna talk about the project and impacts and really about telling your story and uh, really start pulling those exercises in here. And this is an open floor to have a conversation. So uh, someone had asked me about the five W's and the how um, to repeat it again. So if you're online, I hope you are. Here it is again, um, just a 
just a quick refresh on what we're talking about on how you build a good story. So again, the five W's are who, what, where, when, the why, my favorite question, and then the how. So how are we doing this? And if, and like I always say, if you can answer all of these six questions, you are good to go. If even one of those questions are amiss, that means we still have a little bit more work to do. So it's always just a good temperature. It's a good thermometer on where your message is and if you have everything you need. So um, these are just simple ways to kind of think about them. Who are we trying to reach? How are they connected with your organization? What is important to them? What is their investment? Why are they invested in this work? Um, when should they care? Um, is it now? Is it two months from now? Is it um, during legislative session? When should they care? Is it all the time? Um, where should they care? Is it statewide? Is it in their local community? What is their investment there? And why? Why should anybody care? Um, and the why changes with the people, right? So if we're talking to families, their why is a little different than someone with a disability and their caregiver, their why is a little different than someone with a disability. Um, if you're talking to an educator, employer. So really think about that who, because that'll expand on your why. So any questions on the five W's in that, um, at least this formula before we kind of keep moving forward? Okay. Don't think so, but we'll just pretend. Okay. Going back to the stories that are right in front of you, we're gonna go dive into our exercises, but I'm just gonna say this was our good refresher, right? Our key driver is our five-year state plan, your council members, whether you have a council members, uh, council members of one or 40 or 50, I don't think there's any 50 persons council, I think, I don't know, um, your partners, and then of course your initiatives, the so people who are being funded by your council or if they are and have projects that are in the community. Those are the stories that are right in front of you. Um, if you remember the council map that I showed you about Ohio, uh, when we were looking for new council members, we went where there were no council members because guess what? Um, we wanted to reach more and more people and solve that no one knows about us problem. So here's the exercise. Um, we kind of we have been doing it here and there, but we're going to do it formally. And whoever wants to participate, please participate. Um, I won't be I won't be Socratic this time, um, but I might. I don't know. And uh, we'll go from there. So start with your own council today, and don't read my answers. I already gave them to you. Um, but start with your own council. Um, so wherever you are, and I see someone with a beach background. I'm really jealous. I hope that's like real. Um, where, who are you trying to reach as your own counsel, wherever you are today and you're working? Well, who are you trying to reach? So we're trying to define our audience. And you can drop it in chat. You can raise your hand. Let's have a conversation, whatever's easiest. Okay, we have business owners, that's good. self-advocates, prospective grantees, rural areas, that's really good, family members, employers, caregivers, lawmakers. Very nice, underrepresented communities, uh, legislator partners, students in transition, um, the young, uh, young advocates, yes, that's big, that's really big. 72 self advocates or no small businesses. Um, really cool. So you have a variety of different audiences, families who need to know about the benefits or need. Um, so a variety of different audiences. Now, what are the chances that um, they're, before we can even go in there, let's not even try that. I'll, I won't skip around. So how are they connected to your organization or how can they be connected to your um, organization? So a lot of you are looking for individuals. So what would be the connection? How will they be connected or are they connected? The Spanish community, yes. Um, we're, we'll talk about that very specifically as well. 
um, underserved and outreach, universities, nursing homes, rural areas, justice system. Awesome, awesome answers. So how are they connected to you all? How are they connected to your council? They're all stakeholders, policymakers. They have lived experiences. Yep. Okay, through common goals. So um, I like what Allison says. She says business owners aren't really connected. That's our problem. So in, instead of saying it that way, let's talk about how can they be connected? What is the connection to the council? What would be the connection to the council? So we're also talking about a new audience, right? A lot of you are talking about underserved communities, lawmakers, justice, um, justice system, other stakeholders, uh, small businesses. I saw that a couple of times in the chat. Um, so these are not only people who may have some are individuals or groups of people that are already connected in some form or fashion, but these are you're also talking about individuals and groups of uh, people who are potential audience members who are potential people to reach your message to. And that's really good because not only are you thinking about who are already in front of you, but how do you keep amplifying that message? So keep that. Um, that's really good. Keep that with you. Um, so the next exercise for the next question here exercise is what is important to them about the council? Why do, like, what is they care about, about being connected to the DD council? And I will throw in a quick monkey wrench on this. This question will have multiple answers because it matters to the audience you're reaching out to. So what a business owner and what's important to them is not the same thing that's important to a lawmaker, is not the same thing that's important to a family member. So what you should start to sort of start seeing is uh, all your audiences, all the people you're trying to reach, how they're gonna be connected to the DD Council, and then what is important to them. Suddenly you should have little what I like to call in a good old days, a flow chart of messaging, um, little boxes of bullet points, like why should a business owner would be important for them? So, or why is a lawmaker, obviously we know why, but let's, let's do it anyway, a lawmaker. Uh, what about potential uh, candidates for office, people who are running for office, right? They, we're not forgetting about election season, but are, there, are they a stakeholder? What about local council, uh, local council members, like in cities and mayors, uh, local government? And then what about educators? So all these people start falling into different boxes because their message is totally different. So families, caregivers, equally the same. So let's see, for business owners, So, um, Allison, would you mind telling me what council you're with? Sure, I'm with the DC Council. Oh, okay. Um, just wanted to say, I thought everyone else, a few other people's councils. Um, so, Allison wrote for business owners, it would be important for them to connect with potential employees and consumers. So, that's really important. Um, talking about employment and talking about, you know, good works, uh, good people for hire who are committed to their uh, career and jobs, like, yes, let's talk about small businesses that way. That's a really great potential partner. Um, let's see, where else are we going? Financial assistance, resources as families for people with DD. People with IDD are constituents, community members, resources. People with lived experiences are consumers, taxpayers. That's a really good message also. Absolutely. Um, so the other question now is in your exercise, when should they care? There is an easy answer to this one and a hard answer to it too. <laughs> There's the easy one.
So again, if you're building this in your head or in your paper and you have suddenly identified the who, which we're working on, and you're breaking it down because each individual or each audience you're talking about, whether it's a business owner, lawmaker, family, caregiver, their how, their what, their when is totally different. And make sure, so Allison with October 20 for Employment First Summit. Yeah, so a business owner would definitely be interested in something that would highlight them. Not saying that they cannot care year round, but then what you're doing is becoming a little bit more granular and saying, well, here's why you should care because we're having this specific event for your audience. And that's what we would call an entry point. That's what we would call something to walk into so that way you can use that platform to not only talk about that specific message, but the bigger role of the council. But remember, each audience, whether it's a person with a DD, a family member, lawmaker, they are going to have a different when. And while it should be always, it should be when it's relevant to them. And for families and people with DD, we know it's always, we know it's all the time. So we know that. And, but now it's about creating that impact and making sure, how are we making sure they're working together that whether, while it's employment, it can be in October, we highlight it during October, but that's an entry point. And now we bring them in at that moment to keep the story going throughout the year. Um, where should they care? That's a fun one. I always love these responses. Where are these people? Where are they? So where is your audience? Oh, I think I stumped them, Cheryl. <laughs> In their communities all over the state, especially the rural. Mm-hmm. Yep. So we're getting, we went from everywhere to becoming granular. So that is really, really important. So a lot of people were saying stores, parks, police, fire stations, obviously our state houses, our schools, doctor's offices. Um, they're everywhere. All the people, people with disabilities are like, their lives are with us. They're in the community, right? Or we're, that's, that's our mandate in itself but they are in touch points with the community, whether you're going to school, whether you're going to a doctor's appointment, whether you're going to college um, or hope to transition into college or an employment space. Those are places where these individuals, those who that you talked about, they're gonna be in different spaces. And, they're, and that's how you start to think about, that comes back to the biggest question we're gonna ask is why should they care? So when you start to think about the five W's and like, so now we're at the why. So why should a business owner care? Why should a lawmaker care? Why should a doctor care, an educator? Let's see, who else did we have in our audience? Mm, business owners, I think I said that already, but let's talk about that again. Um, why should our young advocates care? Um, things like that. So think about their why. And the most important thing is to remember is that, again, when it comes to talking about impact, when it comes to telling your story and telling people why this is important for the council, it's really about positioning about why should they care about your work, right? And make sure the top three things you talk about are their benefits. What is the benefit of hiring someone with a disability in the workspace? We all know the benefits. Let's tell them about it. Let's tell these small business owners how they can participate. Um, did they know that there are benefits for them if um, they hire individuals with disabilities? What if it's something as simple as, well, what about accommodations? Well, we can, we can put, to, put you with the right uh, communications team or the VR team to make sure you have what you need. Uh, whether it's a young, young advocate, how do we get them involved in um, 
in legislative advocacy, if that's an important piece for you, or self-advocacy leaders or employment or transportation, things like that. So why should anybody care? And why is it important for them to care? Because you know your why, you know why you're doing this. But now we have to make sure that this audience you're trying to reach, the who, they know why they should be caring too. And that's how you start to craft your message. Because once you have your basics, then you can start building on it because then people are bought in. You have to make the message resonate with who you're talking to. Don't talk inward. Don't talk to yourself. Talk to the people you want to reach. So they can bring a piece of something to the cookout. I like it. <laughs> Okay, and the question, the last question is how? How do they get involved with you? How do they get involved with your, with the DD Council, their work, their impact? How should they care? Um, is it attending your employment summit? Is it about um, hosting a webinar or is it um, applying for a grant that you should, uh, that you are releasing for, um, I, I don't know, give me something. Uh, self-advocacy or financial asset development. I know one of my councils is on here right now. So, um, so what should we care? What and how should they get involved? And that's about creating that impact. But when you're telling stories and when you're collecting the stories from people you've already had an impact with, like a grantee or a fund or initiative, then you're also not telling, you're also saying, we've already, we're doing the work already. Why don't you become a part of it? Why don't you just, be a part of this space, whether it's uh, becoming, like I said, um, becoming an employer that hires individuals with disabilities, or you are, um, you're a college and you're looking to start a program for students with disabilities, anything like that, or you're working in a transportation department and you're thinking about how to expand in the rural area, broadband, digital, these things, like how should they care and how can they help? Some things are not going to happen overnight, as we all know but it's always important to start those conversations early. Devica, I think we have a question from Emmanuel Jenkins. Okay. I don't. Thank you. Okay. Sorry, I got to raise my hand. It was kind of hard for me to use the chat box. No problem. So thinking about thinking about all of the, the different W's and then how to draft your message, is uh, is advocacy or self advocacy? Should I say, is that a good word to use if you are trying to reach young young individuals with disabilities who may not know what advocacy is or self advocacy is? So, should we really be using the word? self-advocacy? Oh, oh, it makes so much sense. You might have asked one of my favorite questions ever. Um, so advocacy, you're absolutely right. Advocacy is a very big word, right? Um, it's a very, very big word and it's such an excellent question. Thank you so much for asking that. Um, yeah, how do you get people involved when they don't speak your language, right? Self-advocacy is not everybody's terminology. And that is something we see all the time uh, when we're talking about this, this kind of space, when we're having alphabet soup sometimes. Um, so how do, you, how do you engage? The question is, how do you engage young advocates when they might not know what self-advocacy or advocacy is? So guess what? We take it one step back and we teach them. Use this platform as an education platform. So instead of using the word advocacy, tell them things like, well, have you ever asked to, um, you know, make some make a presentation bigger on a screen so you could see it better? That's advocating for yourself to be able to see something more clearly. Um, and that sounds very simple, but that is a form of advocacy. So what you're trying to say, what I'm trying to say is taking a really big word that is very layered in this community, right? The, in our in the council work, that's not only part of your fundamental mandate as we talked about earlier but it's used across the board. So when you're talking about getting new uh, buy-in with young advocates, let's break it down. Let's make it simpler. Talk to them in their language. 
What does that mean to them? What, how can we make them understand what advocacy is? Well, say something, um, use some examples like, have you ever wished you could explain to a lawmaker why this would be important to you? Well, that's a form of advocacy. So start to connect the dots with action and a word, if that's a word you definitely want to use. So, um, but I've definitely heard the word advocate becoming kind of a bigger word. It's very, very loaded. And so sometimes it's about simplifying the message and making sure what is really important in all communications work is to make sure that you talk to people in their language and meet them where they are, because that's how they're going to come to you. Um, it's so easy to get caught up in our own world. I get, I happen to meet all the time and using jargon. And then I have to remember that I'm, I'm not talking to, I have to make sure that people who are not in marketing or communications understand what I'm saying too. And that's true for everyone. It's nothing special to anyone. So it's really about when you are talking to those audiences that you just talked about, talk to them, to talk to them, explain to them, be clear in your communications. And the way you can do that is answer these questions for yourself again. If your five W's in the how are not explaining what advocacy is to a young advocate who might not know, your message isn't quite clear yet. So use that formula to break everything down because if you can't break it, if you can break down advocacy, like, well, what is advocacy? Um, where is advocacy? When do we advocate? Uh, what is it? Who is an advocate? And how do they advocate? Suddenly you can break that message down even simpler and you can explain to a young advocate, well, this is what this is and you should get involved or you already do the work become a part of the DD council or its work. So I'm not sure if I answered your question, but I was basically trying to say, simplify the message even further, drill yeah. it down. Yeah, you did answer You okay. did answer my question. Um, so thank you, thank you for that. So, oh, thank so you. what a great question. So what you're, uh, what you're saying, I guess, and I, and I like the way you explained it. So why we are building up to you know, really simplifying and taking a step back to look at the bigger picture. Do you do that within more than one messaging? Or, I mean, more than one message, or do you do multiple messages or try to create? Because I could see me trying to create a post and then the post is too long or the email is too long. So then I lose people anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, yeah, so our attention spans have gotten shorter and shorter with time. Uh, but so is it better to do multiple or, or how do I tackle, tackle that piece? That's a great question. Um, so when you say multiple, are you talking about multiple messages to like a young person, like young youth advocates or just across the board? Well, I, I mean, I guess, I guess it would be to me, I mean, we, we serve we serve a array of people, but but there's this really big push for new self advocates, right? Because mm -hmm. people like myself are, you know, wanting to move out of the way. Um, but but so I guess I guess the focus is young people, but I'm kind of confused on how do I take this step back, but also give them that message to invite them to the table while also trying to educate them through an email blast or, or Facebook or some other means of, of messages. Sorry, my question is all over the place, but. No, it's not actually, you're right on. Um, what I would recommend you do, so the best way I would recommend is keep the message very simple and keep it to one thing. People's attention spans have literally dwindled down um, and we're battling that, right? So you're asking a really good question and to um, talk about in journalism, actually what we used to call it. And it's still, I'm really grateful. It's still called that. It's called top of the fold. So you have to make sure the message that is most important that you wanna get across is when you open that email or you see that Facebook post or uh, you have that publication or whatever it may be, 
that needs to be in that screen right away. And whatever's at the bottom can be scrolled down to. And if that's important, we can add that. But the most important message, get it to the top and make sure what you need to get across. This formula works every time, I promise. Um, you have to have it at the top. So let's just, um, let's just use it as an example. Let's just use an event as an example. That's usually sometimes the easiest ones, right? You have an event you have a, and you're sending out an email, for example, put it at the top of the fold. Make sure that's the first thing people see and make sure it's the biggest message that's amplified across the board. And that way, keep it to one message and anything else is at the bottom. And if people can scroll down and that's fine, but the most important message, keep it at the top. You will have different messages for different kinds of audiences because what matters to one won't matter to the other. Um, it's very rare that I have found in communications that everyone was after one message. It's very rare, um, no matter what, whether it's a council work, whether it's a small business, um, corporate, it doesn't matter. Everyone has a different, um, everyone has a different kind of audience, right? And I always think about Coca-Cola in this way is that the people who drink Sprite are, um, the people who drink Sprite are not the same people who drink uh, Diet Coke. Their ads are totally different for those people. So even though it's the same company and essentially the same product, um, so, but their people are, their audience is different. So the same way, um, yes, Gary, top of the fold is a newspaper reference, my good old newspaper days. Um, but so what we're saying is keep the message simple, keep it to one very important thing. The minute we start to become, add more and more messages into one simple uh, statement, you're gonna confuse your audience. So if you're trying to add more things uh, or say more different things, keep a cadence, keep it to the sim keep it simple, keep it to the point and make the call to action, whether it's register, whether it's sign up, uh, whether it's download a booklet or PDF, keep that very clear. Um, and that's also another big part of accessibility. Uh, this is a tip. Whenever you're asking people to do something like a call to action, make sure the call to action is not just read here or click here. It's read this, read this PDF or download the PDF. So that way, when the screen reader does those, um, pulls them up, it actually reads the call to action as well. So that's Thank it. Thank you so much. No problem. I hope that helped. I kind of felt like I rambled. <laughs> no, I did. It did. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Absolutely. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, so kind of going back to what Emmanuel was talking about a little bit, once you kind of have these answers and it says you're building out your audience, your who, your what, your where, whens, and whys, now you can decide, now you can figure out where you have to be for these people, right? Uh, where you have to define your channels. Um, I just got a question about TikTok. I will get to that in a minute for sure. Uh, defining your channels, guess what? You don't have to be everywhere. I hope that's the most exciting thing I told you today. Um, but um, you do not need to be everywhere. A lot of people have this myth that if you don't have every communications channel sitting on your platform, just don't have anything at all. No, let's go back to being simple. Let's go back to the basics. Um, have a simple communication like email marketing. If you want to use um, MailChimp or Constant Contact, um, Again, I don't know price points for any of those things. Um, or even if you want to create a listserv and just send a simple listserv out to your um, audience once every quarter, that's great. Um, if you have social media like, like TikTok, um, and I'll, I'll quickly talk about uh, TikTok, but if you are on Twitter or Facebook, um, just, know, just know that these are great spaces they are changing every day. They are changing every single day. And that's a most important thing to not, that's why we don't wanna rely solely on digital, like social media at all. I know I love social media. I think it's an interesting space, but it's changing at such a rapid pace that it literally has something new every day that even communicators and marketers like me 
Uh, sometimes we kind of have to throw our hands up in the air and we're like, okay, we'll just get to it when we get to it because we cannot move as fast as they can. Um, so really think about social and think about Twitter and all of these things. And with TikTok, I will say TikTok has really changed the game of social media. What it is, um, it is basically taking short videos and making basically live video posts, of, but I believe it's only like 10 seconds. So think about it this way. When we started in social media, like a long ago, right? It was a picture and a post. That's kind of where social media started. Then they were like, we can have video and you can make the video five minutes long. And people somehow sat and watched video for five minutes. And if you can imagine that today, like, I don't know if anybody can. And then it started, and then you had Twitter, which was 140 characters. You have to say your message and be out of there. Twitter basically started changing the game of communications because it, bit, and it was funny, it went longer by 280. It doubled its characters. But then suddenly we were like, can we say it from a five minute video to a three minute video? Can we do three minute video to one second, uh, for one second, one minute? And now suddenly TikTok is about 10 to 15 seconds. So TikTok has created an amazing pull for younger advocates and there's a huge disability community on TikTok. The upkeep of content on TikTok is very hard. Just like Facebook was and social um, Twitter was, while they're still hard and doing it really well is very difficult um, and difficult meaning it's a lot to upkeep. TikTok has a very different um, game when it comes to how quickly you need to move on that platform. So while it's a great place for younger advocates, there are a lot of great disability advocates on there doing some really great work and are doing education work on um, disability. So I, I wish I had them at the top of my head, but some are doing some simple work on what is a disability? How do you get involved? Um, there's an individual, I believe, in Pennsylvania who was talking about getting out the vote through the disability advocate. So TikTok is really, really great. Just make sure if that's where you want to be, um, you have the wherewithal to do it. It's a lot of work. It is a lot of content building, uh, but you can definitely think about um, Instagram is becoming a little bit, Facebook is sort of fading here and there. Um, and new apps for young people is TikTok. I will say Snapchat. I've, I've never not really heard too much about Snapchat here and there. It's kind of like, if you want to be on it, you can be. It's not a big, brands are, brands are here and there on it, but every brand is on TikTok right now. And it's changing. It's going to change tomorrow. It's going to change, probably change 10 minutes ago. Um, so we just have to really, you really have to figure out when you're working with limited bandwidth, even if you have a big marketing team or you have a communications team, really make sure that when you want to be on a platform like that, consistency and frequency is going to be key. So you have to be able to always be on. That's, that's the secret nobody tells you. Um, so make sure you're always on. And if you're reaching younger audiences, um, just think about like TikTok is really where they are. And they're uh, a good powerful tool would be Instagram stories. Um, Instagram has become still, is still popular, uh, but TikTok has definitely overtaken it. But Instagram is a little bit more popular now because of photos, um, the live quick stories. People want quick. Um, they're becoming shorter and shorter and shorter and shorter. So really think about it. Um, to kind of go back to the presentation real quick, when you're defining your channels, um, you're able to also kind of do a light content audit, right? So using your five W's and the how, you're kind of able to really figure out what's missing in your content work and what's in your library, in your, um, in your library of assets. And it really works, I promise. So when we're, we're talking about in the last presentation, in the first session, put, uh, ask your grantees for the work ahead, right? When they're doing the work, you're funding these projects, um, make sure they're giving you that details, that reporting back to you. Ask them for photos and graphics and things like that um, from their grantees or council members. 
do you have the photos? Do you have videos? Um, like I said, smartphones today are really, really good. So if they can do something like that, that would be awesome. Um, if you have capability and budget to get high resolution photography and video, utilize it, utilize it well and utilize it to make evergreen things so they don't run out ever. So you can always make sure things are, you know, like you can do small videos, like what is the council? Um, what does it do? Things like that. Always make sure things kind of have an evergreen taste to them so they can always be used. Um, think about testimonials, success stories, talk about your council members. Like I always say, do we have anything about who our council members are? Where are they from? Uh, we've done things like council member spotlights where we just ask them, what's the best thing about being on council? What have they learned? Um, we use that sometimes in council member council promotions. Um, and then if you're hosting an event, um, like I said, projects or webinars or anything, um, check off the five W's and the how. If you can answer all of those questions, those six questions, you are ready to go. And what it does, it also helps you build a strong communications plan. It might, and, and a communications plan is basically really thinking about your message. Who are you trying to reach? Where are they? What's the frequency you're going to reach them at? And what are you going to tell them? And that's your communications plan. And just remember that elevator ride. It's a three to four floors. We're not going up the, we're not going up the uh, Empire State Building on this one. <laughs> so this really allows you to start narrowing things down. And it's a lot, this, this formula, I know I keep talking about it, it's like my favorite thing in the world, but it does drive a lot of my work. It really keeps it simple. It really starts to make you think like, did we answer every question? And one of the things that it also really helps you answer and try to put yourself in these shoes is make sure that when the message is going out, the person on the other side is able to understand it. We always talk for ourselves. We always think about internally like, well, I get it. But think about if someone is a stranger, doesn't know anything about the council, will they be able to understand what you just said? or what the story says. It's always a great litmus test. It is, um, it's always a great litmus test on how to make sure that we're effectively communicating and demonstrating this impact that we are supposed to be demonstrating. Um, that is my big exercise for you guys. I know that was um, probably bigger than I sounded, but I know there were a lot of chats in there. So- um, Oh, there's a lot of chats. <laughs> I hope lots of chats. I'm a little scared of it, but I'll be there. But here we are open for questions and discussion and um, I, I'm, I'm all yours. <laughs> Let me throw a couple out to you. Um, so there's a question about age ranges and different platforms and what new apps are out there um, that young people, younger people are accessing that you can suggest? Uh, TikTok for sure. TikTok, okay. is, TikTok has beaten YouTube as a social media platform, and that is a very big deal. So TikTok is where it's at right now. Um, a lot of people um, are thinking, I'm not convinced on this yet, but I, I have been told is Pinterest is also um, really popular. Uh, I have not seen the growth of Pinterest as much as I think that convinces me, but um, I can always be taught again. But the young, the youth, are on um, are on TikTok. It's really coming down to those very short videos, very quick videos. Um, again, it's just a lot of quick work. The other thing about TikTok, I will tell you, if you're using, if you're thinking about going, it's a commitment. So yeah. when you are a smaller council, it, it sometimes does hurt to say like, okay, I can't be on this. So think outside the box don't rely on digital only. Um, remember, they go to school. We can reach out to schools. We can reach out to educators. We can think about some grassroots kind of style of outreach when you don't have a, a sole person committed to, um, committed to TikTok or something like that. All of these platforms take a lot of work to build up. Uh, you know, we have, we build up, we take care of multiple accounts for different clients, whether it's a council or not. And um, Instagram is still growing. If you really want to start to play in that um, Instagram, I do love it a little bit more than I like um, Facebook. Um, 
but the best way I can kind of narrow it down for you all is Facebook, I would consider, and of course it's changing, it's changing a lot. Uh, Facebook is kind of like your word of mouth. It's your word on the street. It's your community. Uh, we, you know, of course now it's changing again and again. And like I said, it's just a evolution. Um, Twitter is where I, is the media, media and politicians. That's where they are. Um, so if you really want to create a base, don't, don't expect youth to be on Twitter. Don't expect like your advocates to be on Twitter. That is where like your media contacts, uh, local state, um, state representatives, state senators, local mayors, council persons are on there. Utilize that channel for that kind of space where you're engaging more in the outreach to the parties that care, like the media and the lawmakers, because they're definitely going to be on there. Um, but, and then if you're really wanting to expand to the youth, I would definitely look at, uh, definitely look at um, Instagram. And if you really, really want to get into TikTok, just know that that's, that's going to, it's evolving. It's going to take a lot of work, but Instagram has now built itself enough that it's, you can build a really good presence, utilize tools like stories and reels and video and things like that. Uh, whereas TikTok is like only video. So okay. just know that that content is going to be super important. It's, and just remember what I said the last session, these are channels. These are not coming with content built. You're the content builder. These are just your output. So if you don't have the content ready or if you don't have the team ready for that kind of stuff, don't worry about it yet. So we had a comment from one of our smaller allotment councils. So I'm gonna call out Nancy Cronin because I just love her. But, um, she and she's recognizing, yes, yeah, social media takes a lot of time. And they've got three staff, including the director. So, you know, it's, it's not a real, uh, you know, the time drain, like you said, it takes a lot of time. So she's asking, what's the biggest bang for the buck? And I know, you know, trying to be on several different channels so that people who need to receive information in a variety of ways, how does that not get so big? And what's the biggest bang for the buck? Sure. Um, what state? Um, Maine. Maine. Okay. So I would definitely want to think about um, and I don't, I'm, I apologize if I don't know if you're on uh, Facebook or Twitter, what channels you might be on already. Um, we have a Facebook account. Just a Facebook account. Um, that's it. Okay. No, no, and that's not a problem. And I, and I don't want anybody to feel like you're behind the curve or, you know, you're like behind the times, like do that's kind of what's really important here is that communications is vast and don't feel that if you're not doing the whole thing, you're like not doing anything at all. Do what's simple and do what's best for you. That's the most important thing I can give you today. But if you're on Facebook, uh, may I ask Nancy, like, um, if you can give me at the top of your head, if you don't have it, that's okay. Like how many followers and how much engagement you have? Well, when we had a, um, a when we had a staff person that was really, really interested in it, Mm -hmm. uh, she posted a lot and we had a lot of followers and then staff people changed and we didn't post as much. And now we have very few followers. So we're at about a hundred followers. Okay. okay. That's totally fine. Um, Tiny. So, no, don't. I, like I said, please don't do not compare and contrast at all. I think that's like, as we've learned in social media as a general, do not, do not get any compare comparison contrast issues on that everyone is different on these spaces. Um, and it just depends on outreach. So the biggest thing for your buck, this is what I would recommend is get a scheduling tool, like hundred percent, get like a simple, I don't know, like a Hootsuite. Um, I, I hope, it, I don't know its capabilities anymore. We use a different one um, because we have an agency. So we use a little bit of a bigger build and it's a different model inside of what we have built out. But uh, simple things like Hootsuite would be good. Use a scheduling tactic. The biggest bang for your buck is really about consistency. That's gonna be the biggest bang for your anybody, right? So if you're a small council where you have three people on staff, let's go back to the original session about building your basics. Where are the stories? Where, like who's right in front of you? And then if you get a scheduling tool, 
the the nice thing is you can sort of schedule them out they're evergreen so think about the posts that don't expire right like who is the council what is the council meet our council members um what do we do as a council things like that things that will not time out because you have a fundamental mandate right what are our five-year plan goals what is the five-year plan so suddenly we've built a small library of content that using something simple as a set scheduling tool you can schedule for a few weeks in advance and right now if you're small one post a week is just fine you do and of course the ideal is about three a week it keeps things up but right now if you're short staffed and you're limited you have small bandwidth but you still need to make sure you hit those numbers and get your impact out there start simple keep it simple so one post a week if you wanted to add twitter you can add twitter and also um the only difference with twitter is that what happens is that you have to shorten your captions because you have a content limit um so if you'd like to add another channel, I would probably recommend Twitter. If you'd like, if you don't, if you want to stay away from the like repeats, um, I would just say probably Instagram. So you can use photography. Just know that if you're using photography, uh, using Instagram, you have to have some kind of graphics. You have to have, it's a photo-based app. So make sure you know that. But let's just say you're sticking to Facebook. Start simple, one post a week on the things that, will never go out of style. Your five-year plan, your um, maybe highlighting some council members, things like that, just simple stuff. Use the formula and you can build it up to a few weeks in advance. So it kind of sets it and forgets it. And then when you have things like Endeam and you have the ADA, then you can sort of focus on, okay, we'll do a post. We can do something around that. But you have something consistent and you can plan it in advance. It's a little bit of work on the front end, but you will see the results as it grows. So you need a little bit of consistency on the communication side to grow that hundred, but you'll get there for sure. Devika, we've got some buzz on hashtags in the chat. Ooh, I love hashtags. Um, <laughs> so, so one of the questions was around since social media platforms extend beyond state lines, what hashtags can we use to be sure that they are attracting attention from people in their own state as in an effort to report to the federal granting agency? Um, so if Delaware is trying, is putting something out and they want to report on how many people in Delaware they reached, is there a way to, to use hashtags or? Wow. Um, I think y'all stumped me. <laughs> Good job. Uh, no, you can't. <laughs> Um, so the fun thing about hashtags is, um, it's, it's kind of a twofold question. It's a content aggregator, right? So a hashtag is really a topic aggregator. So if you're saying, let's just say, um, I'll just use, a, a who, who is that one I haven't picked on yet? A DC council. And, um, then, and I'm sorry, I don't remember everybody's acronym. So let's just say it's DCDD. Um, so, and so like, if you're using something like that, the, the most I think we can do there, there are things, there are things called geofencing and geotargeting, which go into that nerdy deep crevices of social media marketing that we're not there yet. But if you're using a hashtag to follow people who are, um, who are perhaps trying to, you're trying to see who's following you and who's, um, who is possibly curating content around your hashtag, one, create a specific hashtag to your council. So whether it's, you know, your own, um, your own council hashtag, whether it's something during a legislative session. I know in Georgia, there is a legislative hashtag. It is not from the council. It is what they use. It's called Georgia G-A-P-O-L. And um, so that is something you'll see a lot of advocacy groups outside of DD just using that to follow in that conversation, right? So hashtags are content aggregators. 
the, the nice thing about using tools like Hootsuites and all of that, they can tell you a lot of information about your audience. So they can tell you where they are. They can tell you, um, they can't tell you specific things like if it's a person with DD or things like that, because um, luckily that's something like right now that they, they don't ask us about, but I'm sure they know. But if you really want to find out how many people are utilizing your hashtag, then you can find out those kind of tracks, like how many people have followed the you know, GCDD hashtag or NCCDD hashtag. And then you're, as you're utilizing tools like a Hootsuite, uh, we use Sprout Social, um, then you're able to kind of see more geographic trends. Are people coming from the state you are in? Uh, maybe the age, the demographic, things like that. But to really, um, to really narrow down a hashtag to a location, um, that that kind of goes into the deeper deeper thoughts of like what we call geofencing, and um, yeah, we're definitely not there yet. So, um, so I would kind of use um, hashtags right now just to maybe follow who's following you and how people are engaging in a conversation with you. But um, in the back end of Twitter, if you're using Twitter, uh, they do have some decent analytics, like in the if you go into your main Twitter page and there's a drop down that says analytics, you can go in there and find some information for yourself um, that are a little bit more generic, like where people are from, their age group, gender, and things like that, if that helps you. Facebook analytics, I believe, um, is okay. I don't, I, last time I checked, they were really, really just kind of bringing that down. Um, so you can still look at Facebook insights, but the, the reason I like a lot of the reason I recommend a third party platform, like, uh, one for scheduling, but two, they can give you really good reports. And, cool. um, just to add a little bit more to that, we've been able to track things like our five-year plan goals. So even like how many times we mention a goal or how many times we mention initiatives, so, um, so we track all of these things for our council. So when we turn in our reports, we can say, we can say 15 social media posts were sent out about the five-year plan or five social media posts were sent out about uh, goal one, things like that. So we can really talk about the messaging and impact. So those are a little bit deeper. Okay. So we've had a couple of folks say um, Discord is a platform that they that younger people like and there's a pretty good disability community on it so that's something to think about and then um, Michael out in Arizona is asking about YouTube is that you know I know you said TikTok is really where people are putting their efforts but is TikTok increasing decreasing um, is it easier to you know get some numbers like because they track the number of views. What are your thoughts um, about YouTube? Yeah, YouTube um, is YouTube is still popular, very, very popular. TikTok just beat it out for the first time. YouTube has been number one for years. Um, a lot of people think it was Facebook, but it's actually been YouTube. Um, I believe there are a crazy amount of, uh, I, I think this in the billions. I know Facebook is at 2 billion um, users. I know YouTube is at but like six or seven, maybe even a little higher than that. So YouTube is pretty popular. Like I said, for the first time, YouTube got beat out. Um, again, it comes back to content. What are we putting on YouTube? Um, content will change across your platform. So do not think, um, so like, like, let's think about what we're talking about on YouTube. Is it an education video? Is it, you know, just good videos to put out there, but build it that you would build the channel the same way you would build any other spot. Um, so I would say it's not necessarily declining, um, but it is is still pretty popular. I would say it's it's definitely um, they're also getting into the shorts. They're also getting into the like small like reels. Everybody's getting into the shorter stuff. So, but what what I will tell you is it's very, very easy to fall into trends. It's very, very easy to fall into trends, but the best part or the worst part about trends is that they go away. And so if you're gonna chase a trend, then you're going to also lose a trend. 
So really think about meaningful communications and where you should be. It's going to change over time. I mean, you know, social media has been a game changer for so much of us, uh, obviously. So I'm not saying don't be on it, but just remember that like everything kind of when it's the big thing, it also fades down pretty quickly. So just think about your audience, think about where they are and what's the message. And I know you all have goals also, but the short form video content like TikTok is now promoting, which is about, I think, like, like I said, 10 to 15 seconds. What can we say in 10 to 15 seconds uh, that will be impactful, that will make sure we get the views or how do we know who we're reaching? Just, and that can be, that's fluid. That changes as you grow as a channel. So I just want to be mindful of put an asterisk on trends because it's very, very easy to get absorbed inside of them. I get asked those kind of questions almost every day. And I really have to sometimes be the, well, let's think about this because it might be popular today, but it can easily fade out in a, in a couple of months. And then you're lost with an audience. You spend a lot of money, time, energy on something that kind of fizzled away. Last year, last year, the year prior, there was a social media app called Clubhouse. I'm not sure if anybody heard of it on here. It was like all the rage. Everybody was like on Clubhouse. It was audio only. Uh, people were having events on it, webinars, but just audio. There was no video. And I mean, I'm not joking. It was everywhere. Nobody talks about it anymore. Nobody talks about it anymore. But so that's why I kind of, uh, I say it with, um, I say it with ambition, but also guidance of keep in mind what you're supposed, your ultimate goal, who we're trying to reach, what's their message. And if TikTok and, uh, and I've not heard of discord and I'll definitely look it up. Uh, if those things are gaining traction, how do we make sure we utilize those? So it's really just about putting some mindfulness around it. And if you're a smaller team and you have already some channels like Nancy has Facebook, think about building those first before we jump into a new one. Okay. And, and we're getting a lot of comments about, um, you know, breaking up your longer videos into the shorter, short form video content. So that seems to be, you know, while I know we, we look at trends when you start looking and, and we do too in TA and, you know, that is that people want the shorter education. If you're doing a little, if you're trying to teach people something, they want it short and broken up. Um, we did have a lot of comments, not a lot. We had several comments about making sure that councils who exist within state government, um, and of course, 80% of you do, um, make sure that you're very mindful about social media platform rules for people inside state government. Um, we have a few councils that are nonprofits, but they still have policies around that. So, um, but you're just trying to make sure that you are still um, following state rules on that. And, and Lee is saying you could have a disclaimer on your website. Absolutely. Um, you know, social media policies are important for your council members. They're also important for staff and really aligning those types of things with, with what the rules are. Um, and if you don't have a social media policy in place for your council, you probably want to look into that very quickly. Um, and we have a few samples that other councils have used. Um, but the designated state agency, most state agencies have some rules around it. Um, you just need to be mindful of what those are. Now, some of you are going to say, if you have a DSA that says you cannot have social media, you're going to say, well, that's interference. Uh, well, not always, but we're going to, you know, we want to be respectful and, and figure out that, like Devika has reinforced, you guys have a mandate to do certain things. So sometimes it's about really working with an agency to figure out how you can fulfill your responsibilities to share information in a variety of ways um, 
and have it be accessible to folks, but still also comply with regulations because there is a lot of abuse. And one of the things that everybody is hypersensitive about is the collection of personally identifying information. And so as an HHS grantee, you're not going to be allowed to collect, you know, do an active collection of personal information. So you, you know, there are some there's the rules, Debica. There's rules, right? Lots of rules. <laughs> Lots of rules. You know, it doesn't sound rules. fun when you add the rules on top of it, does it? <laughs> <laughs> um, so would you recommend that folks really check their their designated state agencies policies and then look to see, you know, what I guess it's all about restrictions, right? What what are what are you not allowed or what what does it appear that would be a barrier for the council to really use certain channels yeah uh agreed if you you are under that kind of um space then definitely make sure you are checking with the higher ups and making sure any kind of communications policy that's coming down from an agency you might sit under um is adhered to um and things like that. Of course, constantly make sure that we're educating, informing, not lobbying. Those are like very that's big, big, big rule. Um, and always just making sure that, you know, if there's anything of sensitive nature um, or policy nature or law, like le legislative nature, just I would always do it checks and balances to make sure. But um, if you are sitting in a, uh, as a designated state agency, please do follow that. And I did see it in a chat like way above that um, make sure if you're doing photos and videos, have releases and things yes. like that. So those are just really important things. I, and I know that I know we might just throw water on something like super fun, but like it's it's going to be really important, especially because you're representing underneath and because of your funding structure. Those things always come into play, um, not only just DD Council work, but I've, I have done this in nonprofit work when they have a parent nonprofit. So mm -hmm. it, it is um, just a, it's a simple checks and balances. Um, I, I will say that, you know, if you keep it, keep it simple, um, talk about your work, talk about your stories, about your council members, your grants, your projects, your success stories and events and things like that, that are relevant to your community. I think you should pretty you should be pretty okay yeah and liz in kansas was asking about do we have any responsibility for the uh, for security of users we reach out to and and that's where um lee lee lynn from uh, texas i believe i'm not sure uh, is saying you can have a disclaimer on yeah. your website so that will help you um you know kind of navigate but i think really it, none of this is new so your states probably have pretty robust um, policies and procedures in place now it's really about figuring out how the council as you exist inside state government with a federal mandate you know the dance you're probably going to have to do some negotiation if someone just flat out says no you can't mm -hmm. um there's always a way always a way <laughs> absolutely and um but yeah just so going back to the website um things if you're under a state agency just making sure um you know we have uh, you'll see this probably have you already are seeing this as consumers yourself um, that you're seeing cookies as a big thing, privacy policies. So we're just making, and if you're under state agency, you should have those kind of automatically sort of like grandfathered you in. But if you um, just making sure that we're not changing information, um, do not give out people's names, lists without that, that's, that's a big no, no. Um, so we don't really, we can't, and that's not a DD council rule. That's an honestly a marketing communications rule that is across the board. That has nothing to do with DD council government. It's just, um, th that has just become a big no, no. We cannot just send people, people's like names and emails. Right. You, can, you cannot send that. So just make sure that those things are protected. 
Um, social media is an open source platform. So um, that means that their information is on there. It's not like you put it on there. People are voluntary giving that information. But if uh, that really, what I was talking about, really specifies to email collection. So making sure right. all, all that information, whatever it is, zip code to race, gender, uh, you know, identification, that's your proprietary and that's their privacy. That's just that's just communication rules across the board. It has nothing to do with duty councils. Um, okay. I did see something on LinkedIn. Uh, I, I saw a few questions on LinkedIn and um, I want to try to find them. Let's see, we have other local organizations. I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure I lost it those questions um, in here. But I do know that there were some questions about LinkedIn. And um, so uh, I think, I'll, yes, I saw Maria asking on uh, building conversations around inclusive employment, equitable wages. Um, yeah, I think LinkedIn, um, I will say LinkedIn is my favorite social media. Don't tell the others, but it is my favorite. Um, mostly because one, uh, as of today, and as of 4.45 PM today, it's still pretty private. And that's why I like it. Um, and its focus is very, very singular. It is professional development. And that's the reason I love it. Um, people know why they're on LinkedIn. LinkedIn is also very protective of what it does, um, of why you're there. So anytime you start to kind of go away from professional development, business development, uh, you know, anything like employment, it kind of starts to flag you and it kind of starts to watch you. Um, so sometimes you sort of appreciate that. Um, so in terms of LinkedIn, if, if it suits your counsel in terms of um, what you're trying to achieve, definitely look into that, making sure if, um, I think Maria had said it was about employment, definitely that's where employers are. Um, that conversation is happening a lot right now on LinkedIn, DEI and inclusivity. And um, as long as, again, just like any other social media platform, it's sustainable, it's consistent, it's frequent. Don't forget that it's, it is not a one and done thing. You have to keep up the momentum. That is going to be really, really important. Um, my question was more in relation to new apps and directing people to one, to one. It's directing state. people to one app as part of an email campaign. So you're saying that, um, so you're saying that you wanted to, as an email campaign, to, to, for people to follow you on a specific channel? Is that what you're saying? This is Liz. Yeah, I, my question is just, if we're deciding on a, on a particular channel, for example, and we say, hey, we want to use this new Discord, and we know that these apps collect information, share information, what responsibility do we have as a council for folks to make sure that folks will be secure on those platforms, right? That we haven't introduced them to something where, I, I don't know. I understand what you're saying. So one, um, it's actually their free will. So all you're trying to say is we're on this channel and if you'd like to follow us and be a part of us there, then you can. So you're not forcing them to sign up. But unfortunately, at least I'm, I know that if we're introducing a new channel, um, and Cheryl, I might be wrong if, if there's something that is more specific they have to do, but if we've done this in other spaces is that we have just introduced a new channel and we've encouraged people to follow us there, but it's not mandatory. So um, right. there, it is their free will to join the channel, be a part of it if they want, but you're just announcing that you've joined this new network. And if they if they're on there, they can follow you and participate and if they're not that's okay so um at that at that rate i would just say you're mostly announcing your your availability on that channel but not necessarily saying you must sign up there so i would just make sure it's not restrictive like only if you're on linkedin or discord you can find this information that's the only thing you can't do but you can just tell people like we're expanding our reach and if you're there meet us there too that's what i would i would be um, comfortable saying that well, Devika, you have been a wealth of information for our network, and I certainly know with the robust um, 
chat and all of the questions that people have benefited from your expertise. And we thank you for joining us this year Absolutely. at the TA Institute. Um, we will be sharing your slides with everyone. And um, I know you guys could keep going and going, but we can't. <laughs> <laughs> we can't. Um, so please, uh, Devika, you have shared your, um, your contact information. So um, if people have, um, it, you know, if they want to reach out to you, they want to speak to you about um, potential services, I know that, that you're more than willing to um, engage. So thank you so much. I'm dropping my email in the chat. Uh, please email me if I can help with anything. And um, I felt like I audited a journalism course. I'm so glad. Uh, <laughs> uh, thank you so much. For, thank you so much for having me, Cheryl. I've loved working with you over the years. And Robin, yes. you for asking me for doing this. It's obviously it's passionate and I love it. And um, if there's any questions in hindsight, please do. Uh, uh, hi, David. And um, and if there's any questions in hindsight, uh, please don't hesitate to email me. I, I love this work. I'm deeply passionate about it. And um, whatever I can do to help, please um, let me know how. Thank you so much. Um, and that concludes our session for today. So you guys are free to sign off. Thank you.